That's right, here's my Ant-Man and the Wasp spoiler talk. That is a spoiler warning for anyone who hasn't seen Ant-Man and the Wasp. You've visually been warned. And this is just spoiler talk. This isn't going to be a play-by-play, -play, as always. In fact, in this movie, there's just a couple things I want to talk about that I wasn't able to talk about in my spoiler-free review. But with those couple things, I really want to delve into it a bit more. So, spoiler talk. Could be three minutes, could be 20. I don't know. Point is, here we go. So basically, the premise of this movie is Hank Pym's wife has been lost to the quantum realm. We knew that. We knew that from the last movie. She shrank in between the molecules of this rocket so she could take out the rocket. The rocket got taken out, but she's been lost to the quantum realm because she kept shrinking until she wasn't here. And now she's stuck there in the quantum realm. So Hank Pym wants to use his tech to get his wife back. Ghost wants to use Hank Pym's tech to siphon the life from Hank Pym's wife so she can essentially fix herself and stabilize herself. Because when she was a kid, her dad was doing experiments on the quantum realm. Big explosion, she got hit by it. So she's in a constant state of flux where she's being ripped apart and reformed again at the molecular level. Which for the sake of comic book movie means she gets to walk through walls. And then you have Walden Goggins. He's in this movie. No disrespect to the actor. I love him, but just... It's... That arc, why? Too much. So that's the basic breakdown and the backstory is Ghost when S.H.I.E.L.D. was like, hey, you can face through walls and you'd be a great assassin. How about this? You assassinate for us and then we'll fix you. And then S.H.I.E.L.D. fell. But by that, that means she was around for the entirety of the MCU. And it's one of those scenarios when you create something new that's been around the whole time and you kind of create plot holes looking back. Not plot holes, at least question marks. And it's a sci-fi movie. It's an MCU movie. It's a movie for fun. Every movie has those moments where you look at it, you're like, does it? Huh, it doesn't really make sense. How did the Joker wire an entire hospital to blow up in one day? Know what I mean? Every movie has it. It all depends on whether or not those moments compromise your entire experience. I don't think so. But if Ghost was around in the world of Captain America Winter Soldier, I imagine S.H.I.E.L.D. would be like, all right, this guy's causing us problems. Instead of sending in the Winter Soldier, let's just send in an assassin that can go through matter, really get the job done. I think we can take him out and then we can control everything like we wanted to do in Captain America Winter Soldier. Well, I guess that was Hydra, but that's the point. Hydra had infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. So if S.H.I.E.L.D. had access to it, Hydra had access to it. Point is Robert Redford had access to Ghost in the time of Captain America Winter Soldier, so why not send Ghost in to get the job done instead of Winter Soldier? I mean, at the very least, might have saved him a housekeeper. Kind of like when you show in a later Star Wars movie that Force Ghost can just call lightning and burn things. You wonder why they didn't do that before. And that's the problem with cinematic universes, really. You expand them, you have to do new things, you have to show new things, but then you're gonna create new things, new tech, new characters, new people, new abilities that you showcase here. And if the statement or insinuation is, well, they've been around this whole time, your audience is going to be like, wait a minute, if, if it was like that the whole time, then why didn't we see them until now? Or why didn't we see it until now? I do ask that question for Ghost's presence in this movie because they've said she's been around since the MCU has been around. And and the leash master of her is a super government organization that's responsible for assembling the Avengers to save the world. I feel like we would have seen her by now. Every expanding cinematic universe will run into this. It's all about when they run into it. I do like how Scott Lang was on house arrest and Hank Pym is essentially a criminal now because Scott Lang was in Civil War. He fought the Avengers. People know Scott Lang is Ant-Man and they know the tech is from Hank Pym. Although Hank Pym could just be like, he stole it. Point is there were repercussions from that. I really like that. Actions have consequences. Sometimes those consequences wash onto other people. That's the reality of life. I like that this movie showed that. And I do concede the fact that Ghost in her mind's eye isn't a villain, but no villain is a villain in their mind's eye. There are a couple villains you can argue and be like, yeah, I know I'm an asshole. Generally though, every villain is the hero of their own story. So people are gushing about that with Ghost, like, yeah, but she's not the villain. It's like, that's not new. That's the way villains are. Zemo didn't think he was a villain. Vulture Adrian Toomes didn't think he was a villain. Even Obadiah Stane in his mind's eye was like, I'm a capitalist. This will gain me profit. It's a good weapon. But I'm not a villain. It's just... It's business. So basically, long story short, fast forwarding a bit, Scott Lang does go to the quantum realm and he finds Hank Pym's wife, which funny enough, she, she did age. I thought she was just still gonna be young, but then they'd have to make the CGI face on her face and she would have to be young forever and that'd probably be difficult. So unexpectedly, she did age. And she did say when she was essentially in Scott Lang's body, like Paul Rudd is Michelle Pfeiffer's character and typing on the keyboard. And he or she says she's had a lot of time to think about this. So it's been a long time for her. I feel like it's been 30 years for her and 30 years for us. I only mention that because Hank Pym said at that size, the concepts of space time that you know, they start to break down. So the fact that she's chronologically the same age, I feel like in that world where space and time are different, 
they're apparently the same. At least they're similar enough, which I find strange. And I'm not gonna posh like I'm some sort of theoretical physicist. I don't know. I'm just saying, as I understand it, when you get that small subatomic, sub subatomic, small enough, if you think of the dimension of space time as a screen door, you're so small, you're in between the grates of the screen. In which case, are you actually in the realm of space time? I mean, you're not on the screen door, you're in between the screen of the screen door. A space in between spaces, so to speak. If you get small enough, that is. And again, I'm asking. Or if the case would be, yes, at the size I'm talking about, time would affect them differently, but it didn't. Maybe they never got as small as I thought they did? Actually, it's a pretty good discussion. Instead of just talking about movies and ratings, let's talk about space time. So let's open up that conversation in the comment section. That's cool. Doesn't change the fact that story-wise, one of two things happened here. Either space and time did affect Michelle Pfeiffer's character differently, in which case she probably wouldn't age, but she did age, which means it probably didn't. It didn't affect her differently. It didn't work differently for her, in which case she would have to sustain her body per normal in an environment that's not conducive to sustaining a multi-celled organism. The quantum realm, when you look at it, I'm not saying it disappointed me. I'm just saying it looked a lot like Dormammu's world. So I now feel like if they're going to another world that's not like our world, not like our reality, at all. Their default is to have little waves and things building from the ground up that look like upside down clay or water. They're like, yeah, it's fine, do it. So they get Michelle Pfeiffer out of the quantum realm, the FBI agent who's kind of a douchebag. I mean, if you have to become Ant-Man to help someone out, I feel like you can give him a slide on the probation. But whatever, Scott Lang fulfills his probation and all is right with the world. And the thing, the dumbest, I thought this was dumb. Ghost is still, she's phasing, her molecules are being torn apart and then put back together again. Michelle Pfeiffer goes, hold on, and straight up ETs her. Just goes, bing, ouch, and touches her temples like, ouch. And then she's cured, it's fine. She just touches her, touches her head. It's a miracle. Because what? <laughs> What? That reminds me of V, like the old series V. Like one of the humans and one of the reptile aliens had a baby together, who I guess is the star child. She grabs these controllers and glows and saves the day. Like, the, it made no sense. It was just like, they're like, we don't know. There. It's just a little goofy to me. I mean, I imagine being in the quantum realm changed her somehow. It's just a simple thing where it's like, she, she needs to change. Let's have her have the ability to heal the villain. Because it's just easy. We don't need an explanation. Suppose it's every bit as good an explanation as gamma radiation turning Bruce Banner into the Hulk. But for some odd reason, this crossed the line. Just magic fingers healing a girl. I just didn't like it. But really, with Ant-Man, I mean, you have to look past a lot. Like, uh, physics don't matter in Ant-Man. Really, if you look at it, if you take an object that's about six feet tall, like Ant-Man, and you shrink him down, an object is comprised of matter and space. You condense the space in between matter, you can thereby shrink the object. Granted, that's from Honey, I Shrunk the Kid. Is, but I've always seen that as the way to shrink an object in a movie. It still maintains all the matter and the mass. So when Ant-Man's that tall, he's a little peg that's a quarter of an inch tall, but he's 170 pounds. Plus, that's reinforced with the fact that they can use momentum and flip people over when they're small. So imagine a peg that big that's that heavy. It'll go right into your lawn. But you look past it for the sake of enjoying the movie. Actually, holy crap, when that guy, when there's that kitchen throwdown, the guy has the knife or the cleaver and he's going after Ant-Man. He can just stop and be like, all right, hit me. <laughs> yeah, broke your knife in half, didn't you? At least chipped it, because I am dense. I'm your density, George McFly. But in the end credit scenes, the first post credit scene is great. Ant-Man's going into the quantum realm to gather up healing energy with this device I guess they have to gather healing energy, which kind of reminded me of the Flash, you know, in the Flash, it's always like, we have this problem, good news, in a day, whipped up this thing that will deal with the problem. I mean, I like the Flash, haven't seen the last season of the Flash, but I like the Flash, but that is a thing they do. So he's there and they're like, we're gonna bring you back in three, two, Nothing. He thinks they're joking with him, and I didn't even think about it. And then it goes to them. Spoilers for Infinity War, if you haven't seen it, in three, two, one. You see Ash falling from about human height. They disappeared. They were they were part of the half that disappeared when Thanos went like that. So now Ant-Man's stuck in the quantum realm. Hank Pym and his wife, they're gone. Evangeline Lily, the wasp. Nice knowing you. And that's where we leave off. Actually, I think it'd be really cool if Ant-Man was supposed to disappear, but he was so small. Again, he was in between the realms of reality, or at least he was outside our realm of reality. And we didn't get hit with it. Then again, he has radio contact with people in our world, so it kind of throws that out. I just wanted to be creative for a second. The second post credit scene is lame. It's, it's the ant playing the drums. It's in the trailer to the movie. That's weird. It's like they were like, we need two. Let's just have an ant playing drums. Of the post-credit scenes, that is my least favorite one. I just like the fact that that Infinity War tie-in in the post-credit scene, 
I genuinely love that. It does make you wonder if there was a news flash of these big metal space donuts landing in cities, if they're part of it totally worked. Man, I didn't mean to dig into this movie. I feel like the last couple spoiler talks, we've just been like, you're a movie. I don't mean for that to be the case. I, mean, I really enjoyed it. It's just some of the things that gave me pause and at least gave me a question mark. You're like, is that really? Mm -hmm. It's spoiler territory, so I figured I'd talk about them here. It might make this video seem a little negative overall. I don't mean for that to be the case. But I got to ask some science questions. That's the important thing about being a fan of science, right? A, don't be afraid to ask questions. B, concede to the fact that you might not know what the fuck you're talking about. And I always err on the side of I'm probably full of shit, I probably missed something. But I'm genuinely curious about it if you actually know, 100% know, the answer to the question. But I will still not like E.T. Fingers. So as for Ant-Man and the Wasp and the Quantum Realm and space and time and how it would affect them at that size as opposed to them at our size, the screen door metaphor and all that, the density of Ant-Man when he's small, and the mass of Ant-Man being the same if he's big or small. What do you think about any of that? Whatever you think, comment below, let me know. And as always, if you like what you've seen here and you want to see more, click right here to see more.